And it's about connections and relationships. That's what marketing is really about, isn't it? Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I have the great pleasure of speaking with fellow podcaster and marketing consultant and director of Abbas Marketing, Io Abbas. Now, Io is an award-winning marketing consultant who specializes in working with built environment firms, delivering strategic marketing content and campaigns. She was recently named and took the overall title of Digital Woman of the Year 2022 at the Digital Woman Awards. She has 21 years experience working across the construction sector for major firms, including Arup, Mace and Ramble. Since founding her own consultancy, Abbas Marketing, in February 2020, Io has worked with a host of construction, prop tech, and consultancy firms, including five of the top 10 engineering firms as listed in Building Magazine's top consultants list. She has a particular interest in working with firms that are driving forward innovation and sustainably led projects. Io is a fellow of the RSA and a non-executive director for the Make an Impact Community Interest Company. She also hosts her own brilliant podcast, The Built Environment Marketing Show. Io has a business studies degree with a marketing specialism from the University of Hertfordshire and has a postgraduate diploma from the Chartered Institute of Marketing. In today's episode, we will be discussing the stages of creating an impactful marketing campaign to win your ideal type of work. We look at how to strategically plan a campaign to best amplify your message. And we also discuss why user-generated content is one of the best hacks you can deploy inside of any marketing campaign. So, loads of marketing wisdom and gold in today's episode. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Io Abbas. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Io, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. A pleasure to have you finally on the show. It's been a long time. I've been following what you've been up to. So you are, you're a marketer. You're the founder of Abbas Marketing, which is a marketing agency which specializes for the built environment and for businesses in architecture, engineering, and construction. So you've got yes. a lot of specialist expertise here. Why Why this world? How did this happen? What? Uh, do you know what? In my first job, I kind of fell into it. So I did a business degree at university and then um, with marketing specialism. And then my very first job was in construction PR. So I worked in a regional uh, PR agency in Surrey and uh basically i we we work for manufacturers so lighting companies like zoom to Pearl staff um okay. you know uh, des deso floor tiles you know all of those types of products and things so i was uh writing press releases selling stories into the press uh, and that was my first job uh so i worked in a pr agency and that's kind of targeting kind of contractors and architects and engineers and then yeah i kind of fell in love with the sector from there on so after that i kind of went in-house and then i started off working for engineering firms. So I started off at a small one, Connorsby, and then I moved to a rather large one, Arup. And then it's just been moving around engineering firms, really. So that's kind of how my background in this kind of sector began. And yeah, so I've been here for like 21 years or something like that, working Amazing. in the sector. Wow. So, uh, yeah. And what, what, and what kind of work do you do with an engineering firm or with an architecture firm? What kinds of areas do you help them improve and build upon? So I guess it, it's it's a range of things. I mean, quite often it's, I guess, having those 
kind of initial chats about, I mean, my main areas tend to be around marketing strategy, developing kind of content, but also and campaigns as well. So it's more a conversation to understand what a practice actually needs, because some of the larger engineering firms, it might be delivering a campaign focusing on a particular topic or doing a piece of research to support their campaigns or marketing activities. So I think it's a range of to- uh, things I can do, but it often just starts with a conversation. Amazing. Um- Rather than ask you um, what are the common mistakes that architects make with their marketing, because I've done probably 100 podcasts where I've asked the same question of, <laughs> of people, who, who's doing great stuff at the moment? Who, what, what kind of things do you really enjoy seeing architects or engineers doing that's inventive, innovative, creative, is, is, is getting visibility and attention? Um, do you know what? I, I mean, I love stuff where people are showing their personalities and who they are. So Mm -hmm. I love well-written content. So I love the kind of blogs and the kind of thought leadership that practices like George and James architects do. I think their stuff is really nice. It's really well-written and it's written to humans, which I think is a huge thing. Um, I also love, I guess I love stuff like, you know, I really love like, people when they're on video or audio or trying to do different things. Is it Acrid Lowry who are doing quite a lot in terms of podcasting, doing lives, also doing that whole kind of um, public affairs, you know, actually going Mm -hmm. out and talking to MPs and having dinners and having those conversations that, you know, so that they're at the top table to actually drive the debate. So I really like that kind of focus. This is what we believe in and what we're going to go out and help them do and how we're going to try and kind of make our mark in the industry. So I think that kind of thing, um, I also do love um, Stride Triglowen, uh, the campaign that they did last year about climate change and that sinking building in the water that was yeah. basically everywhere. I mean, they run great campaigns and their website and their content's gorgeous. So, yeah, that's a free people. Amazing. Free I love it. I, I really love it. Like no, it, it's, it is. There's, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, with social media and the ease of which people can now create podcasts and content and things like that, they're, we're starting to we're starting to see a lot of architects and engineers kind of you know, experiment with ideas and let their personalities out and kind of have this media element to their businesses and really drive a thought leadership um, kind of, you know, set of content forward. And it's it's fantastic. It's really, really, you know, it's exciting. Well, because I I think there is that whole thing as well, isn't it? We know becoming your own media publishing house in a way, because Mm -hmm. it's like, you don't have to be completely reliant on the actual traditional publishing houses anymore. You can actually get your content out to your target clients and audiences yourself. Yeah. And it's your message in your way. And I kind of think, you know, that's what's there to be explored. And we're all kind of used to it in our own personal lives. So actually Mm -hmm. in our business lives, I think, you know, it's a huge opportunity for us to kind of get who we are as a practice and get our voices out there and what we believe in out there in our own way. And I think that's the opportunity that more people do need to grasp at the moment it feels very polished and stuff and I think well I I I do like when people I mean we we often see this with large corporations you know that they have there's a there's a brand for the business and then there's a personal brand for the for the CEO or for the leader and that becomes quite interesting and I like watching certain um, architecture firms Mancini Duffy in the US in New York springs to mind where where Mm. they've actually um, they've got a fantastic kind of brand for the business and then all of the partners individually have got their own personal brands and they're all making their own content and they've all got their own yeah, podcast. Fantastic. And it's just, it's, it's amazing. And they've got, and it's all very different, but all together it kind of completes this really rich um, personality of the whole practice. And yeah. the content is really well, well produced. There's interesting conversations um, and that, you can tell they're having fun. I think that's one of the things. It just looks like they're having fun and they're enjoying the kind of chat show architect lifestyle, if you like. <laughs> the architecture chat show is your next line. Right? Exactly, the architecture chat show. This is what every architect needs in their life, the architecture chat show. <laughs> like a hundred different sofas all looking very very stylish yes <laughs> <laughs> exactly i mean that's exactly. i mean it's it's really interesting but i think you're right there are some figureheads who are doing social media very very well i think um you know who are starting to look at what their businesses are doing and actually building their own personal brands and their own viewpoints and i think that opportunity is there people want to hear their voices and opinions so definitely seeing practice leaders more doing that more is, is a really good thing and I think it's interesting as well that, um, you know, people, we, we talk about communicating value and we talk a lot about 
um, you know, what having the, the general public understand what it is that architects and engi- engineers do more clearly. And social mm. media provides that opportunity. And, you know, the, the beautiful thing about social media is that it doesn't have to be polished. In fact, it works better when it is a bit rough around the edges or when we've got a glimpse behind the scenes of something or, you know, just picking up the phone and speaking into it. It's a very easy and fast way to to produce content um, and being able to actually document the story behind buildings or the document the process behind things and how things are actually getting designed. People are fascinated with it. There's a, there's a hungry yeah. audience for it. And also I think it will make it easier for us to sell what we do mm-hmm. because I think half the issue is, is that people don't understand that actually I don't just suddenly get out and make this drawing and your building's there. It's like, it's a whole process. There's a whole stage. There's a whole consultation. There's all these things that I end up doing. Yeah, And I think, it will help us all to kind of show where we add value by sharing those processes. Mm-hmm. Because I think quite often people think, oh, it's like, it's really easy, right? It's like, well, actually, no, it's not. This is this full process. This is what we work through. This is what we consider. And then it kind of, we are showing where our value is. And I think that's the important part. And that's for all disciplines, me as a marketeer, but also, mm-hmm. you know, architects and engineers. It's like, we all need to do that and demonstrate this is what we do. Because I think, you know, one of the biggest, you know, one of the presentations I remember giving once to when I was working in the house was about, you know, everyone was like, great, you know, this director's talking at this event. And it's like, you do realize that's been a six month project for me, don't you? And then you've actually talked through the steps of from selling that into that organizer to everything else, getting all the assets together and briefing him and, you know, exactly the same thing, you know, same type of process. But when you take people through that, then they realize, oh, it's not just straight away. It's like, well, no, you've just seen the end result. And Mm. I think that's what we've all got to get better at doing is talking through that process. Absolutely. So we were going to talk about campaigns today and what is, let's let's start off with what does a, what does a campaign look like? What is it? So we might hear this word and it's not necessarily, we often hear this word. I'm, I'm assuming this is one of these kind of marketing words that has been picked up from the military and the kind of, the kind of world of. I don't know the history of it i did i did look it up though like beforehand and like the definition from marketo which is like an email provider was around it being a strategic sequence of steps and activities that promote your company's product or service with a specific goal in mind which i think is actually quite a good yeah kind of it's promoting what you do yeah. and i guess in a consistent way and i think that's what campaigns are and it's i think it gives you a focus which i think is the important part because with marketing it's so easy to try and do too much stuff, have mm-hmm. too many messages, mm-hmm. focus on too many channels, and it just turns into a blur for people. And I think it's honing in one kind of idea, topic or service or campaign and really giving that, I guess, airtime. So so what, what what makes a good campaign for a practice? How do they decide on a campaign? What are the what are the elements of it? Because it, I, I like this idea um, that, that, that we're actually looking at something marketing wise for a finite period of time, as opposed to we've just got to market, we've just got to market, we've got to be, always be marketing, which is, which be- then kind of becomes too complicated and then nobody does anything. I think for me, a campaign either starts with an idea or something or a trigger or something, a reason for doing it. So I think you need something like that to kind of kick it off. So something you want to promote, it might be you're going to be at an exhibition. It might be, you know, there's something that's happening that you want to, I guess, do. And it has a goal in mind. You have a goal in mind. So it's a beginning and an end. So you know what that is. And then I guess for me, it's about finding, you know, a number of marketing activities that you can kind of group together to kind of build a bigger whole. So it's about having a, you know, a number of activities that happen over a specific period of time. And then actually executing that with like similar messaging, similar targets. And it's just so it all kind of combines and in many respects so that it compounds. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the key thing is that I always think a campaign is about compound. It has a compound compounding effect whereby your message is getting out there regularly. People get to kind of know you for that, understand what that is. And that could be you're going to be at a show in three months and then you kind of do a run into that or all of that kind of thing. So I think there's a number of things, but I think that having an idea or something you want to promote and a kind of predefined time that you want to do it for. And I think that's kind of the big kind of underlying aspects of it. 
so so ch- so choosing a theme for a campaign i can imagine this is this might on the surface of it appear like quite a daunting task and i could imagine my i could imagine myself kind of getting too um attached to oh, this has got to be the right camp it's got to be the right thing it's got to be the right idea <laughs> And then mucking around with it for ages, as opposed to what you just said there, like it could be as simple as we're going to be at this exhibition, as opposed yeah. to some sort of profound, you know, statement to it the world and to the industry. It doesn't have to be huge. And I th- no, not world <laughs> domination. No, it, it, it can literally be quite simple. Or it might be that, do you know what? We really want to speak at this exhibition. No, we want to speak at this conference in September. Mm-hmm. What are all the activities that I can do that will help me secure that? Do you know right. what I mean? So it could be something like that. And it's like, great, I've got a focus, right? It means that, you know, these are the organisers I need to get to know. You would Then you would understand, okay, it might mean that I need to do some thought leadership pieces on this topic, which is a topic mm-hmm. I really want to take to that show. Okay, I need to connect with the organisers. Who are they? Great. Who do I know who spoke last time? And then you start building up that picture. So what's the activities that I can do to secure that thing that I want to happen in September? So I think it's just looking at it in that tactical way. Mm -hmm. Um, So it doesn't need to be a massive thing. It can literally be be that or could be something like, you know, I want to, I don't know, work in a new sector or enter a new market. And think about how you look at that in a cohesive way Mm. and how all your marketing activities support you to get there. Well, that well, that's a very interesting one to to kind of consider. And perhaps we could kind of look at that as an example, because there's so many practices yeah. that want to be moving into new sectors, and we'll see it with every single, with every practice. Basically, is there's always there's always this <laughs> desire to move into a new kind of project typology, whether it's for to you know whether it's out of their own mission and purpose and sustainability for example mm. or it's a, a recession proofing strategy to diversify your portfolio that wants to move into a new sector is always very interesting and obviously with contemporary procurement we see um you know it, it, the, it appears like it's increasingly difficult because you always need to have loads of portfolio example. you need to have loads of example so if you're moving into a new sector and you haven't got any experience in that in that world, what would be? How could we start to craft a campaign around it? What what kind of things would be useful thoughts? I think think I think I guess start small. So right. actually, you look at who the main kind of clients and the main players. I would normally say start with research and understand what's going on in that that segment that you want to want to go for so I always think it's understanding what's going on there Mm -hmm. who are the key players what topics are they talking about and also who are the people within those organizations so it might be you might turn around and say who like I always say who's it's like following the money and the decision makers yeah so understanding who they are in those organizations I always kind of say which job titles which job titles are these people and then you start to build out a picture of how this sector of market operates because that's what you kind of need to understand is what's all the moving parts here mm-hmm. and then I guess it's a guess about then it's about looking inwards at yourself so you know what have you done in a previous life or previous role or whatever that is applicable to that sector also what of your existing work is actually applicable to that center because you know for example if you're designing large span spaces for a aviation that mm-hmm. could be a good transferable skill to say industrial if that's what you want to go into yeah so it's large band spaces isn't it so the types of design skills that you have for that will be similar so looking for those kind of transferable skills that you have mm-hmm. and learnings that you can take from one segment to another because that's a different way of looking at things well th- well that's very interesting what you that first part there as as well talking about the research following the money following the decision makers i've spoken to many architects in the past um, who have been very good at going to conferences of other industries, just totally immersing themselves, identifying trends, and then hosting conversations, events, chats about those trends in somebody else's industry, having had no work in that industry before. And oh, guess what? <laughs> now, now you're talking with a load of people. It's as, it's exactly it's fascinating. And also, I think it's also that thing is that people kind of know that they need to learn new stuff. Mm-hmm. And, if you know, like it's it, you coming in as a new starter, you maybe don't see that as a negative. That could be a positive. And I think it's going in with that positive mindset of actually, what can I really bring to this other new segment? What can they learn from my existing experience? And I think it's that kind of mindset and mm-hmm. looking at that transferable skills that I think is the opportunity there. So not looking at, you know, 
being it, you know, being the new the, the new person, you can ask those questions that people, you know, other consultants won't ask because mm-hmm. they're not involved. You know, they won't see it because they're not new anymore. So I think, yeah, be curious, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, great. Okay, so so identifying trends and starting to do to re, do research, then how would you recommend a practice starts to build up their arsenal of marketing collateral? <laughs> if you I, like. guess it de- I guess it depends, doesn't it? Because you could kind of go for the kind of direct approach of finding those types of people on LinkedIn, for example, starting to connect with them, commenting on the things that, you know, engaging with their posts and what they do and starting to kind of, I guess, become part of their wider ecosystem and they'll start to understand you. So you could start those conversations, but then also you can start to kind of post, you know, stuff about the trends or what you're seeing or what you believe is happening in that sector yeah. and start to use relevant hashtags and start to join that conversation. So I think it's starting to kind of, sow the seed so it's not just going to that conference but also what else can you do to start be seeing as a thought leader on that industry or you're bringing something fresh to it so mm. I think start to do that um and then I guess it's just about you know once you've got those kind of warm warm kind of connections then start to reach out to them I think that's again that's quite interesting again the use of social media and if you've got a uh, a kind of semi-decent looking profile at least you've got a profile picture and perhaps a banner on it It doesn't need to be you know over the top or anything but but like you say just being able to join into other people's conversations online or kind of leave a, a thoughtful response to something or make a contribution you're kind of jumping into these conversations quite quite naturally and this and again this is a totally new world that we didn't have available to us sort of exactly and actually it's largely free as well so you've got it as you know as a research tool you've got it as a way of connecting with people but also I mean you can also do things and look at your own individual profile and what you write and you could Mm -hmm. sort of you can actually talk about the fact that you want to start moving into this sector this is what you're seeing please reach out and connect with me you can put that on your profile there is nothing to stop you doing that Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I often hear when I'm talking to architects, um, you know, when, they, when they've identified, they've kind of started to paint a, a good la- landscape of the new sector that they want to enter into. And they've identified these yeah. key figures and these people. And maybe they've, they've kind of ventured out and done a LinkedIn connection request. And then the question comes up, well, what do I say? How do I... How do how do I how do I start a conversation? What do I do? I do I send a portfolio? Do I just say hello? What- Please don't send a brochure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say that straight off. Don't do that. I've seen people do that. It's like, oh my god, no. That's what my all my LinkedIn <laughs> connection requests are these days. People, you you accept and then bang, here you go. Here's bang. A, here's it. Here's it. Here's a brochure for drywalling. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Which is what you need, right? Uh, absolutely absolutely that's <laughs> we kind of say if you wouldn't do it in public don't don't do that online like you know <laughs> literally <it's> just like <laughs> so, people forget just... common decency yeah. and just yeah just and... at least say hello first <laughs> so, I, I i think it's do you know what I think it's I I think the easiest way is actually just to start connecting and engaging with what people are posting I right. think to start that relationship then rather than heading straight into the kind of direct messages because like, yeah that can okay, be so, a bit so, much so, and... so not sliding into the DMs straight away then <laughs> play it as you would in a bar no <laughs> can I get you a drink <laughs> I'd be like no thank you block um so <laughs> So don't do that, right? Um, but I think it's more about that. I, th- I would actually say, like, actually engaging with stuff that companies putting out, and it's just so they start getting used to seeing you around. Okay. And then you can kind of have a kind of, oh, I saw this report or I saw this article that I thought you might find of interest. You know, you could see something in, you know, the AJ or whatever, and go, mm-hmm. actually, I read this. I thought you might find this interesting because of this. And it's like you're not asking them for anything, but actually, you're sharing something useful. So right. I think if you can do little tit- tidbits like that, that's a nice way to start a relationship. Got it. And so, so when we're talking about a a campaign, then like, what does it look like on the inside of a, 
on the inside of the business how, how do we know that it's a campaign is there a start and finish date to it i would a- normally i would normally sit down and kind of actually draft out like what elements would make up that campaign so if there's a research element what kind of you know if i'm drafting emails what type of thing i'm looking to do so I actually have a campaign plan mm-hmm. you know and then what's likely to be done in social um roughly the types of firms and target audience i'm looking at so i would actually kind of build it out I, I tend to build it out and kind of think, right, okay, what's the beginning and end? Where's my final goal point? And then I kind of turn that into a timeline and an overall kind of plan of action. Because then I think that gives you, then you know what you're doing each week, what you need to do, how it all builds up. So, so and that, then you have a rough one. So, Go on. so, so, how, so, so what kind of objectives or measurable objectives would you want to, you know, are useful for a campaign, what kind of targets would you be looking at? Would it be just measuring in terms of how many connections you've made or how many jobs you've won or does it not? It could be not, connections. Not... It could be if you're, if it's an exhibition, like for example, I had a client who went to an exhibition last year to launch, launch a new furniture product. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was very much about let's get as many people to the stand so that we have follow on calls and meetings. And we, you know, and that, you know, so our thing was about, how do we get traffic and raise visibility so people want to go and visit that stand? And then when people are on the stand, we wanted to get their details. So it's like, you know, that's what our kind of goals were. So it's like, how do we create a buzz? And that's all our goals was around creating, you know, a buzz so that people want to go there and come and see this new piece of furniture. Mm-hmm. And then it was building from there and then looking at the social media activity we put out, We, you know, what marketing activity we can do. So, for example, we ran a competition uh as well as how do we engage with the organizers so that we get the most out of being at this show and connecting with them which really helped us in terms of our kind of social media visibility when the show was on as well as how do we connect with our existing clients who are coming to the show so we've got free tickets please come along you know sending them emails direct mail you know emails before the event saying hi we're going to be there this is what we're launching come and see us reconnect with us And then post event as well. And, and, you know, having those emails planned out, you know, post event. So we literally planned out what was happening before the event, at the event and after the event. So then it's all of that. And then it's kind of what happens in terms of BD and the follow up. We had all of that planned before we even went there. Right, right. So it's not it's not a kind of reactive get a load of names and then kind of figure out what we're going to do. There's, there's a there's no, a and that's one of the reasons writing a plan and just sitting it down. It's like sitting down and doing it is quite important because it focuses your mind. This is my goal. What do I really need from this? Right, and then then you can look at like what the follow up needs to be so that this works and this is successful. And I always think it's that thing of just looking at it holistically. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned there like the idea of a competition. What 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 do you what did yeah. you mean by that? That actually you had a competition. Oh no, that was audience? literally they were they were a manufacturer and they were exhibiting at Surface last year, and we ran a competition and gave away one of the new products. Oh, we okay. literally did that, okay. and, but we did that as user generated content. So the, the actual right. idea was take a picture um, of this, come and see us, and tag us tag a picture of yourself on our stand on your social feed. So we got all we got loads of user generated content. We had like 75 oh, I entries. So people were just taking a photograph of you at the stand, tagging, yeah, tagging which, the which again was making our social media go huge. Yeah. And it built the momentum. So the more and more people going, we've got to go and see that stand. And it you know, it was great. It worked really, really well in terms of that whole com- compounding effect. Yeah. So we did a lot of kind of pre event stuff. Then we used kind of user ger- user generated content as we call it, you know, to kind of build even more awareness when we were at the show. So it was great. So basically in- encouraging people to participate in something actually yes. can be very, very meaningful. Yeah, because yeah. again, it's about connections and relationships. That's what marketing is really about, isn't it? And I think it's finding way, different ways that you can connect with those audiences you want to reach. Mm-hmm. And we've just got to come up with ideas and ways of doing that. And I think that's the most important part. So in in terms of, because this is really interesting, because we, we've spoken a lot here about actually the campaign is is much more relationship fo- focused and about identifying individuals and providing some kind of value first and starting to, to generate a engagement mm. and a relationship. Is there space then for the kind of the myth of market of of marketing or this this sort of you know the kind of broadcasting and the portfolio and all these other tools that that we were trained to spend our lives dedicated to and to <laughs> make sure that that's what the most of, do, do, are these are these um, are these redundant or do they have a place or 
in my opinion, I think that stuff is dying out because we're heading towards a kind of, you know, where, you know, personalization in marketing, you know, actually targeting me and understanding me. Mm. It's happening in our consumer lives. And I think what we experience as a consumer, we're now expecting to experience in business. So we want people to understand that actually I'm not interested in, you know, rail stations. I'm actually interested in aviation projects only. Don't send me your whole brochure. I'd rather know about what you're doing in that specific, you know, you can find that information out about me online yeah. and you can send me stuff that's actually relevant to me. And personally, I would prefer to be sold like to like that. And I think that's really important. I think, you know, think about when people pitch to you, mm-hmm. what makes you stop and take notice? And that's for me, it's generally when somebody has looked at my website, understands what I do, sends me a tailored pitch rather than sits there and sends me dry, dry, wool, a dry, wool catalog. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, I'm the worst person to send that to. I don't know anything about this, you know, and and that's it. So, you know, it's there. It's just, can you take the time to understand me and then target me properly? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I know, I know on LinkedIn, if somebody um, sends me a message and they say, I just listened to your recent podcast with, 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 of, of AO and here's what and I really liked what you guys were discussing then bang I'm I'm in I'll I'll yeah. take I'll stop I'll respond whereas if they just you know s- go straight in with the with the brochure then yeah it doesn't it doesn't work actually I've got a question for you how many good podcast pitches do you actually get or how much junk do you get uh we get we get a mix like in terms of people pitching to be on the podcast yeah yeah. Um, well, we because we get quite a lot from PRs this day these days, and they tend to know what we want, and they and they're quite they're generally quite good. We do. Oh, wow, that's good. Yeah, it's it, it's it's generally it's generally pretty. They're pretty they're pretty good. We do on occasion get some some a PR, usually not an industry PR, and they might have misunderstood what our podcast is about, and then they pitch something to do with cryptocurrency or something like that and you're like no nah. yeah it's normally crypto people that get it wildly wrong and they're just in, spam but, ones but, yeah, yeah yeah but but in but in general actually because it because it's prs that we largely deal with or or it's my myself and actually reaching out to to individuals that we do get we get yeah. pretty good pictures these days that's good i get rubbish ones that's why <laughs> for my podcast that's why. <laughs> well, clearly not established you know <laughs> I'm always like, okay, what is this? <laughs> I was just wondering. Obviously, that's longevity. That's what happens when you guys show that's been going a while. <laughs> and we just have the name business and title. I think that's what it is. It gives people a proper podcast. <gasps> I'm not rebranding again. <laughs> but no, but that, but that's, it, it is interesting. It is, it's interesting the, the, you know, kind of, um, what what I find often is a mismatch is when we have um, products or manufacturers making pitches to be on the show, and that often comes. And often, if I do have those sorts of guests on, they end up the show ends up sounding like a like an advert. Yeah, and it's not interesting. And I think, well, it's interesting because if you had a manufacturer or someone like that on who was doing some really innovative stuff or, or it might be, you know, or they said, actually, we'd like to come on, but with this client who's using the product and we're going to talk about it from this way, mm-hmm. that would be more interesting. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it's that kind of thing. You're right. And I often think it's about, you know, understanding really that person who you're pitching to, what they need from you. Yes. I think that goes for podcasting. It goes for anything, really, any type of proposal. It's kind mm-hmm. of like, actually, how can I really? And then you have to listen to a few or, or do some research and just understand what makes that work. And so, so how, 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 they how, would you, how would you recommend them practices um, engage with the, the kind of more traditional press and other forms of current media that are not their own? So not, not content that they're creating. How do you get yourself published? How do you get yourself, you know, in articles and and all this kind of stuff? What, what would you recommend as a strategy? I think it's about having an opinion, right? So looking at what's topical, what that, you know, actually read the read the publications that you're looking at getting mm-hmm. into. So looking at what's their regular features, do they have a comment section? You know, what do they tend to cover? Also, I mean, some of them still do the forward features list over what they kind of, the more kind of regular features that they do. Yep. I think it's just getting a flavor of that and looking at, I guess, the types of contributors that they actually have. 
and then understanding, I guess, what you have to say and where that could slot in and help that journalist. And I think you have to view it as in, how can I help them to do their jobs better? Yes. And make it easier for them. And I think it's going in with that rather than, do you not know who I am? Do you, you know, <laughs> do you know who I am? And then expecting them to do stuff. Because I think that's kind of it. It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and just appreciate that they are actually very busy. And I think that's the thing is like, you know, and also I think there's also the hooks of, you know, what's going on in the news at the moment. So is there a government announcement? Is the budget happening? Is there, you know, was there a huge scandal somewhere that you think actually I could do a comment piece on this mm-hmm. about from this angle? So I think it's like, yeah, just seeing what's out there and where you can fit into that debate mm-hmm. and how you can really help and push out. Well, I, I think that's yeah. very interesting, actually, you know, um, trying to recognise that, you know, there's, there are journalists there that they need help with their jobs, if you like, and you being able to present a trend or a comment on on a trend and actually you can bring in yeah. other resources and the article is not necessarily about you, but you're featured in the article and you can bring in other architects or yeah. other engineers who are all doing something similar and you know you might share the limelight a little bit but actually it's beneficial for everybody and it's much more likely to be able to get to get published and it's, and it's valuable it's valuable for the for the journalist exactly and i and i also kind of i think the other thing that sometimes people don't realize is like stuff like i mean linkedin articles don't always do well in terms of reach right right in terms of thought leadership the actual linkedin articles mm-hmm. but they're good for SEO. So like if you write about certain topics and you, you know, post it as a LinkedIn article now and then, like, I mean, I had it, like, I think the other year I got approached by a Times journalist who'd read something I'd written three years ago on LinkedIn, oh, an wow. article. And I, I was in a feature. I was like properly in a feature. He just literally lifted out the comments. He wrote, he sent me an email and said, I've seen your article. I'd like to use it. Can I use it? And we'll credit you and everything else. And it was like, but that was a piece of work. That was a comment, you know, a, a Fort Leadership article I did three years ago. So I think those things are powerful. So mm-hmm. you can kind of use those as well and just make sure you're getting the most out of them. And yeah, they help you secure what you, we know, future articles and, 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 and opinion pieces that help your business. Well, I guess things like that, um, articles, writing articles and publishing them on LinkedIn and, and something like this, like podcasts are so useful because they've got this long tail like they just exist they and they float around on the internet for years and years and years <laughs> and people just have to search something and then up it comes again and then all of a sudden somebody's stumbled into your world and they see that there's like you know 300 podcasts there on the, on the same topic and it's like oh right didn't know this 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 was there and it kind of, it like it's, it, it's that compounding effect that you're talking about exactly and i think i think that's it and you've just got to get used to that new way of working i guess and thinking it's not just a one hit be on the front of the aj it's like actually there's lots of stuff you can do to help yourself along and then that will help you in with that so so when we're looking at a a campaign for a for a practice for example is there a is there a recommended time frame for it Uh, is there campaigns that you know can you get them to can you make it too long and it kind of loses steam is it better for them to be short and punchy and do you should you change i think that's I think that's, I think that's like, that's a bit, I'm going to say it's a bit of a how long's a piece of string thing, right? Because I think like some of the, you know, if you've got a main massive project, that's a five year project, right? you know, overall, that's a huge campaign, Mm -hmm. but then it will be split down into one year plans and, and, and you know what I mean? So I think it's kind of, yeah. And if it's a small thing that you want to do in two months, you know, it still be a campaign. I think it's just about having an overall kind of cohesive message you know roughly where you're going and what you're going to say and roughly what your outcome you're after. But mm-hmm. I think the time frame is depending on what it is you're trying to do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, yeah it does. It does. So interestingly, because you're working with not just architects, you're working with all sorts of other businesses in the kind of built environment space. I would imagine yeah. that some of your clients are marketing actively to architects. Would that be correct? Yes. They say perhaps engineers yes. or manufacturers. Could you give us a little bit of insight on like how do other businesses market to architects? Like what are some of the what are some of the <laughs> what are some of, what what are, what's some of the psychological profiling that you use to help help <laughs> others? So what am I gonna <laughs> reveal my <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer this. No, uh, do you know what? I think it's just I mean for me it's kind of it's understanding what architects are interested in and, mm. and also 
yeah, it, it, it's a really good question. I'd never actually thought of it. Um, it's funny because actually a lot of it, because I'm working with quite a few larger engineering practices and I have done for over the past couple of years. And actually a lot of that is like looking at kind of more, because we quite often we're looking where who, who holds the budget and we navigate towards those people. So it's yeah. not necessarily architects and engineers. Um, but actually when I'm thinking about some of the smaller kind of, construction tech and prop tech companies I'm working for. Mm -hmm. I think it's more about, you know, who in, uh, quite often it's about who in the practice should we be talking to? Right. So who is that person who is the specifier or the decision maker? Who's likely to hold the budget? Who's likely to kind of throw a spanner in the works in procurement and IT? And then we kind of build that out. And mm -hmm. then we look at, I mean, I kind of don't go into kind of demographics that much, but I probably look more about what their challenges would be. So like, you know, if it's IT, actually, I want to know this is going to work. It's not going to suddenly crash my whole system. If it's, you know, and then you start to kind of build out that picture and then you get the messaging that you need mm -hmm. for whatever campaign or whatever you're trying to do or whatever thing you're trying to sell. So I think it's more about understanding roles within a practice yep. and whose right. who's role is likely to be, uh, doing what you need then you know who 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 end up buying your product or service so it's, it's, again it's about breaking that down so it's yeah so again it's kind of it is really individual and really f relationship focused on yeah. and trying to understand who that particular person is and, and then seeing what they're about basically yeah, yeah exactly you... and it's just kind of sorry go on I was gonna ask how, how did you do this before tools like LinkedIn like you know, because because now it seems so obvious just to jump on LinkedIn, start doing searches. People have got like pretty much their CVs and their whole work careers posted online. Well, how did you do this before? Like, how would you find um, out? Quite often, do you know, I think quite often it's like just talking to people, going right. out and meeting people. And I think it was it's about that, but also talking to people in your own organization who are out selling. Right. We're out having those conversations. You know, what are mm -hmm. you hearing? How's that working? And I think it, it, it's that. And it's just that whole kind of reading the industry magazines. What what are people talking about? What's What are the themes coming out of that? So I think it's mm -hmm. using all the kind of areas of intelligence you can. And then it's a jigsaw puzzle, right? And But yeah, it's yeah. a lot easier with online now to actually find the information. Yeah, cause I, I guess it's quite interesting, you know, when I've... Um been in conversations with certain architects and they've been kind of trying to they've gone for this research phase and you know maybe they're then they know something about this one person but then you know they're they're kind of an enigma or they're mysterious or there's these people who, yeah. and it's like we're well, now now where where what other what other kind of resources are there outside of you know linkedin and and social media oh company and, reports are also good annual reports any uh -huh. investor statements are also very good. That's I often get loads of stuff from there because then you you often understand what their overall company strategy is, right, and where it is that they're trying to get to, and then actually that gives you a lot to tap into. Like you know, if they've got huge sustainability ambitions, then actually if you're trying to sell to them as a product manufacturer, then you need to understand what they are, and that's a great way of an intro. I can see you're looking to do this. We've got this product that might help you reach your goals. Your goals are this, and it's great, you know sustainable you know they you know websites company reports annual reports investors if they're a public listed organization the investor relations stuff is great to kind of understand actually what's driving this firm and actually what's there as we call it in marketing the stay awake issues i always yeah. think that's a gold mine great basically finding out what their pains and problems are the stay away totally are, and really actually like, yeah like that's that. a great source actually yeah love that that's brilliant that's really really fascinating so do you, do you recommend then that with, with a if a that if we use the example of say a, a medium-sized architect practice say 10 to 30 people should they mm. be as part of their kind of annual marketing strategy should they be perhaps kind of cycling through a number of campaigns or should they try and focus on the same like riffing off the same kind of message or you know, or, or sometimes um, if a practice is trying to find its identity or it's kind of in the process of discovering who it is, which, you know, sometimes can happen as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think figure, figure out, out who you are. I think figure out who you are and then go out and shout about it. Because it's otherwise it's like it's confusing to the audience. They're like, uh, <laughs> you know, like when it keeps changing, you're like, I don't know what you stand for. So I think have those tough discussions before you start going out 
big time. And it doesn't, you know, it's just understanding like who you are, what you stand for, your mission values and, and, you know, just getting a couple of succinct pages together of, of that. And then it's like, actually, these are the, our focus points for this year. How are we going to hit those goals? And then you start building from there. And I think, but yeah, you do need to understand what your message is because otherwise it gets confusing for the audience. Mm-hmm. And once you get that clarity, it helps you in your proposals. It will help you in everything, your marketing. It will help you even just when you go out networking and talking to people because you'll know this is what we, who we are and what we do. Amazing. So yeah, Brilliant. I think it's a process. It's a good process to use your, you know, just to get you where you need to be. Love it. Excellent. Well, I think that's a, a, a great place to to conclude the conversation. There's some real nuggets of wisdom there, marketing wisdom. So <laughs> thank you very much for illuminating us on the world of uh, um, an effective marketing campaign. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolute pleasure. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.